billions of brain cells are not done forging links with billions of other brain cells. Eventually, there will be trillions and trillions of connections between cells, charged with electrical pulses rippling like lightning storms across the hills and valleys of the brain's deeply furrowed tissue. Every cell in its place, every link between cells carefully organized. Nothing random, nothing arbitrary. What we would really love to understand is how the brain during development generates millions and millions of neurons, sends them to the right position in the brain, and then somehow instructs each of those individual nerve cells to form very, very specific connections with one another. You can think about development like a play, a play that follows a script that is written down by the genetic code, but it has no director, it has no producer, and it has a bunch of actors that have never spoken their lines before. Despite all this, you pull the play off. To me, that's a miracle. thinking about Maslow's hierarchy and also integrating something called Vedic philosophy that looks at higher stages of development, um, spiritual stages, if you like. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grimerica Show. We're going to be chatting with Dr. Richard Barrett a little bit later. Uh, but first, Galactophagist Graham, how's it going, buddy? <laughs> Pretty good. I hope you didn't make that up right now. <laughs> I didn't. I hope, actually, I hope you did. I hope it didn't come from a listener. No. No? No. From your daughter? From your two-year-old daughter? No. Uh, so, Galact yeah, we do got... Do you know what a galactophagist is? No. Hmm. What is it? Milk drinker. Really? Yeah. I thought it had something to do with galactic. Oh, it's galacta, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, we got Richard uh, Barrett coming up here. He's He's, uh... He's done some great work on measuring consciousness for actually kind of cultural consciousness too. The, the way, a way to measure it in like corporations personally and uh, nationally, it's pretty interesting stuff and it's interesting to see some of the results. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was a fascinating chat. It'll be good. Did we have to stay up late for that one? I think we did. I think that, that was, was like, like a midnight, midnight one. Yeah. Yeah. Midnight fucking. Yeah. Yeah. In Midnight in Grand America. We should have, like, that could be, like, a special episode type thing. Actually, this is probably going to come out as an extra episode. Once you have the studio out in the garage, then fucking... We can do all-nighters. It'll open up, yeah, it'll open up a lot of different things. Later interviews, two in the morning, you know what I mean? With a fear of waking up the kids. Yeah, yeah. Just bring my little bunk in there and we can... You can sleep in the studio. So as Darren floor, mentioned, we, we have a... We'll get we you one of those little mats in the corner you can curl up on. Yeah, we have a new studio opening up in the garage. So uh, before I forget, we had a remote viewing exercise from a couple episodes ago, and the coordinates we were given was 2105-6611. It's a real-time event, or no, it's a real-time. Present time. Present time, sorry, present time thing. And so we want to mention that, that uh, people have been sending in their, their personal results, and then Darren and I are going to do this, and we'll get... Uh, get the the actual thing sent into us and we're planning on first i'll rate your results no you can't do that okay <laughs> so if you get your your results in by the 10th we're going to release it on the 12th of june so it's going to happen pretty quick here so then are we going to get in touch with him a week after that so for the 19th release we'll know what the actual location was Oh, I know. I was thinking we do it. We get in touch with them before the release on the 12th. Oh, we can't know that before we do it. Oh, yeah. No, okay. we're going to do it. I'm going to do mine in the next couple of days. I've been saying that for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's okay. I can't rate them. It'd be funny if I rated them and then I was wrong on one. But then we could see how good my rating is. Yeah, why? I don't understand. What, what are you going to rate them based on? You can't just rate them. 
based on my own premonition. So we're talking about our episode with John Herlowski and uh, he's, he's pretty understanding. He'll, he'll, I think we should get his, uh, get him to send it to us before the release. So envelope. we can just do it once. We should get him to send it to Lisa and put it in an envelope that we can open. Oh yeah. If you want to do that, that's fine. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Uh, Darren's trying to sneak sneak up a UFO quote in the week. Jingle on me. In the week. In the week of the week. So here in it is. The, in the morning. This is a good one. This is a special for Richard Barrett. There are many reasons to believe that they, UFOs, do exist. There is so much evidence from reliable witnesses. That's from Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. In the London, London Sunday Dispatch, March 28th, 1954. That's it, buddy. That's it? Yeah. How about another one? Oh, I, Scramble and ground. <laughs> are you serious? I, yeah. yeah I don't know. No? No. I can get one real quick, though. Okay, let's go. I'll give you five seconds. It All is right. impossible for any man-made machine to make a sudden appearance in front of a jumbo jet that is flying 900 and 10 kilometers per hour and then to remain in steady formation paralleling our aircraft honestly we were simply breathtaking that was from japan airlines pilot kenju Turachi in 1986 i probably butchered his name sorry kenju kenju Haragachi. that's better that's good one eh? yeah, pretty good yeah i think that i think that might be one of the events from uh, Leslie Kane's books, UFOs, generals, and pilots. No, UFOs, generals, pilots, and government officials on the record. Pretty soon we'll be able to have a Graham's profound UFO quote of the week that's actually you. A quote you made. If I had the effort, I'd go back through all the episodes and clip <laughs> out little profound Graham moments. Uh, that's a good idea, buddy. And then mix it a bit, mix it into a cheesy pop song. Graham. Like that? Yeah. Oh shit, what did I do? Oh, we get sued for using that now. She's got she hit it big, I think. Really? Yeah. In Asia. We'll get a cease and desist. Mm. So what do you got for me, buddy? Well, I got I got a synchronicity and I've got some feedback from uh I'm a rambling gram with synchronicities all over the web. And Darren is skeptical about everyone and don't believe it yet. This is from Trish. It's a, I would call it a, a synchronicity, I think. Let's see what Darren thinks of this one. So she I'll says, a judge of that. and I have a tale for you under which category I leave it to you to decide. I have this old, no, I have this oil picture that hung on the wall of my childhood family home in which figures in a picture of the family, mom, pop, five chillins and me on daddy's knee. Five chillins. Yeah. What's a chillin? That's a short for children. So she says, well, I'm all grown up now and 60 plus years later, I stuck the oil painting on my front lawn with other things I thought the universe should redistribute. What it was, was really, I don't give a effing shit. The wine helped. And so somebody on their way to work, I presume, being a road that leads to a highway that whisks people to Toronto, stopped for it in, less, in the less wee hours of that very same morning, good taste and all, and spirited it away. So be it, I thought, resigned. So what, what, took the picture? Yeah, off the front lawn. What was the picture of again? The figures in their family, like mom, pop, five chillins with her on the chillins. on daddy's knee. Does it say chillins? It does, yeah. I've never heard it. Children yeah, described as a chillin. No. Huh. She's trying to write like with an accent, right? Probably not a Canadian one. Anyways, that was several years ago. Well, a few months ago, I went into my local second-hand shop to find a frame that seemed vaguely familiar holding a mirror. I walked out of the store that Saturday and thought about it seriously and decided I would go back to the store when it opened on Monday, and of course, which I did, and there it was. So I brought it, I bought it, and took it home. And the more I looked at it, the more I thought, I felt sure that I knew it. I turned it around and saw the back of a canvas. 
And sure enough, as I lifted it out of the frame, it was it. The picture now hangs on my present wall, and I tell everyone who comes the tale, and I show them the photograph of me on my daddy's knee with the picture on the wall behind us. It gives people goosebumps. Now that was a good series. Spe- so good it was left there and speechless. Huh. Is that a synchronicity? Yeah, I think so. Oh. It's a different category of one, I would say, but the chances of you, like, you know, going back to the store and buying a picture frame with a mirror in it and having your old picture that you left on your front lawn, like, years ago in it, that's pretty cool. Same town? What's population? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that. Well, I should have emailed her back and said, I I know Darren's going to (laughs) ask what the population of your town is. I'm from a small town. Probably only one second hand shot. Buddy's driving. Oh, fuck. I could, throw a, piece of, I could be, throw a piece of mirror in there and bam, that's a $50 bill right there. Even still, I could it, see it just like the guys in storage wars. Even still, it's a coincidence that the same person will go back and buy it years later. Because she recognized the frame. Yeah, well, she thought she recognized it. Anyways, it, she, it was near Toronto, so the population's probably pretty, pretty Probably. Big. Yeah. The eternal optimist. Yeah. I'll give it a four and a half. It's just like backing up our listeners, man. That's all. Okay. Four and a half pending further information. Anyways, thanks for the story, Trish. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. I got some feedback from uh, one of our previous guests who likes to listen to the show, which I found, I find absolutely fascinating and quite humbling, actually. So this is to me, you, and Red Pill Junkie. I thought I'd read this out on the air. Because I want to say hi to to Renee and Tamara as well. Can't wait till their book Rennie? comes out in the movie. Oh yeah, Re- <laughs> Renny. Sorry, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Who hopefully is listening to this on his night shift? Sorry, dude. But I can't wait till your Every book comes. <laughs> I can't wait till you know what else he says. I say, I call his book the one great year instead of just one great year. He says you always call it the one great year, but it was an absolutely great book. Darren's wife just just uh, loved it as well. Anyways, he says, I've been listening to you a lot lately and just finished listening to all the past shows and I've noticed or rather not heard you talk about the faces that resemble the greys at the site of Tiwanaku in Bolivia. I sent you a photo we took while doing our research for one great year, Stone at Center as it's called to the locals in one of the lifetimes our main character experiences. This megalithic site also includes Pumapunku, is a plethora of anomalies and they just found and have received funding to uncover a pyramid recently found under the current site, which should, should yeah, which suggests it's much older than is currently expected. The temple of the Kalasasaya face, <laughs> the temple of the Kalasia face statues encircle an area covering 120 by 130 meters and the faces resemble different facial structures of people from all nationalities kind of like a united nations kind of complex at the center of this is a statue that outlines the precession of the equinoxes anyways i thought you might enjoy this congrats on another milestone year two we forgot to talk about it last week but yes it's uh our second birthday it's over no it's kind of like two days ago really officially isn't it june 1st we say June 1st. So you guys are doing a really great job. I look forward to my night shift, so I listen to your banter and insightful discussions. See you guys at Paradigm. <laughs> That's from One Great Love, One Great Adventure, One Great Year. From Rene. Rene? Rene. <laughs> it's like my NASA thing. I just can't. NASA. <laughs> Rene from NASA. I can, I can read re- Red Pill Junkie's response if, if you want. Sure. Okay, so Red says... Hey, Rene, you know, Chase Chase Klutzky mentioned that very stone face last year during her presentation at the Paradigm Symposium. Obviously, we have to be very careful with our interpretations of ancient art forms belonging to a different culture than ours. One man's gray alien might be another man's spirit of the dead. A wink. That was from Red Pill Junkie. Thanks for your It kind of looks like maybe a Chinese person. No, it's gray for sure. It's they're, a great. They were part sure. of. They were part of the culture back then, just like another race. <sighs> but no, we should talk about that though. That's an interesting stuff going on there. Oh well, yeah, get someone on who knows what they're talking about. 
okay. more than me we'll, or we'll you do. or yeah. grabs best guess. Yeah, we'll do, buddy. <laughs> For sure. What else you got? Oh, I got an interesting one here. I've got a story from a kid. On acid? No. Oh, While Darren. dreaming? What? While dreaming? No, he's, oh. he wrote a letter to his uh, local meteorologist. How do you get it? Never you mind. After a visit from a local meteorologist to his school, a young man was so impressed he decided to write him a thank you letter. Needless to say, it's pretty epic. I thought this kind of just suited our show for some reason. This must be from like a f five or six year old kid to his meteorologist. Of course it suits our show. Are you ready? You always miss your cue. Dear Mr. Ramon, thank you for coming to our school and teaching us about weather. Someday when I become Supreme Ultra Lord of the Universe, I will not make you a slave. You will live in my 200-story castle where unicorn, serv unicorn servants will feed you donuts off their horns. I will personally make you a throne that is half platinum and half solid gold and jewel encrusted. Thank you again for teaching us about meteorology. You're more awesome than a monkey wearing a tuxedo made out of bacon riding a cyborg unicorn with a lightsaber for the horn on the tip of a space shuttle, closing in on Mars while engulfed in flames. And in case you didn't know, that's pretty dang sweet. <laughs> Sincerely, Flint. Look on back for drawing. So he's got a sketch on the back with a guy in a throne. <laughs> and there's a unicorn says, your donuts, master. <laughs> and he, the guy says, marvelous. Where'd you find that? I, What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a kick out of that? Oh. You don't like it? That's hilarious. Where'd you find it? Or do you credit it at least? It was on Chive. Chive? Yeah. Oh, God. A monkey wearing a tuxedo made out of bacon riding a cyborg unicorn. With a lightsaber for the horn. Doing, That's pretty creative. We're doing the chive now. I, I just, I just, you know. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, Vancouver uh, this weekend. Cloudhead Games uh, on Vancouver Island. I'm going to go check out the, I'm going to do a demo of their new game with the Vive headset. That should be pretty cool. Which one's that then? That's no. one for Sony? No, that's for Valve. Valve, the big uh, game company, the g big game distributor company. And they make games as well as distribute them. <clears throat> they uh, came out with their Vive headset, which is like an Oculus, but the, you can actually tell where you are in the room. They have this light lighthouse technology. It's kind of like lasers telling you where you are in the room. So it's you're like fully immersed freaking lasers freaking laser beams are you bringing the recorder i'll bring the recorder yeah i don't i don't i'm not going to promise they'll do anything I want, I want a recording of you while you're in the thing okay well okay i'll tell my sister that my sister will be there with me she'll help me out with that then some interviews okay and then i'm also on going to george again. i'm also going to george nori and friends on saturday june 6th at eight o'clock at the hard rock casino in vancouver it's actually Coquitlam, but uh, if anybody's... Isn't that where the... Uh, where the one? Hooker Killer was from? No, that was Port Coquitlam. Oh. <laughs> Not Coquitlam, it was That's Port right. Coquitlam. It's oh. different. Okay. It's up the road. Yeah. yeah. Just down Other the side road. of the tracks. <laughs> Pretty much. So, um, yeah, I'll be there with some friends and probably my sister, so if anybody... Uh, is heading there. It'd be cool to uh, to chat and have my it's the first meetup, the Gramerica meetup, white, white Gramerica shirt on. Yeah, so uh, Richard Dolan's going to be there, I think. So that'll be good. You can interview him. Uh, no. Why not? I don't know. Maybe. We'll That's, see. I think you can see do how it. I feel. You can do it. Uh, don't don't pressure me. People listening to this episode can. Don't no, try and persuade no, no, Graham no, no, to do no, it. No, 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 no. I've, we've talked yeah, to Richard mentally. already, and I keep bumping in him. He, th he probably thinks I'm following him around. I've seen him at like three conferences lately. Maybe you are following him around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. I think uh, no, I'm not. Um, of course, 
support our value for value model help us keep the show uh 100 ad and sponsor free affiliate free um check out the different options there grammarica.ca slash support uh we got tons of people who contribute in the way of uh artwork or newsletter or um music stories money yeah money Hey, we got some voicemails too. Did you play oh, yeah. them on the last episode? Yeah, I played uh, the Fletcher one. Did you? Okay. Thanks uh, for the voicemails. There's a pretty funny one too about us Canadians. That was a few episodes Did ago. Did you play it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, well, you should pay attention. Oh, Keep up. Actually, you want me to listen to this? You gotta tell me these things. Keep up. Yeah, so of course, check out all the support options there. Um, been kind of slow lately so hopefully we can get a few people jumping on there i uh, haven't had to give out an email address for a while so let me know if you want one of those if you are a subscriber uh sign up for the newsletter for america.ca slash news check out darnelldigitallink.com uh he of course is the official web designer of gramerica he designed our website and takes care of all those fucking problems that we don't know how to yeah, thanks, Darnell. Uh, what else? Well, thanks to Napoleon for the episode art. It's been great. So if people want to contribute to that, that's great. And and I like getting sp- spammed about lucid dreaming, trip reports, sightings, strange experiences, shamanic journeys. What else? Yeah, I'm like getting spammed right in the face. Yeah. No, I, it, it, it is. It's, it's cool to have some people that uh, don't mind uh, us talking about their stories. Yeah. Kind of what it's all about. Word up. And we're going to make crop circle soon. No, we're not. Some we're of us be are. Crop circle fakers. Some of us are. <laughs> Just don't tell me. You're going to fall for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to come in here talking about the crop circle. <laughs> and you've made it. <laughs> and I've made it. Can you Just believe set, it? Setting me right up. Uh, that'll be good. Okay, well, I guess I'll need some help. That's right. I can round up some people. I'm not too worried. People who are less, whatever you are, be part of an elite club. Me or you? You could, but you're passing up on it. I don't want to be a crop circle faker. They're all fucking made by people. No, they're not. Yes, no, what's they're the not. difference? They're not all. Maybe some of them are. No, Most like of them. All are. of them. All of them. No. Everyone. No, I don't, no, I don't buy Everyone. It. <laughs> Too many, too many personal sightings of orbs of light and unexplained phenomena within. Well, that's because weird shit happens when you make a circle. <laughs> Not because <laughs> circles are made by weird shit. And that's uh, a good. That was a good quote. I could quote that. Use that as your profound UFO <laughs> quote of the week, bud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, enjoy the chat with Richard Barrett. It was a fun one, and we'll see you in the outro. Okay, guys, in Grub America tonight, we're going to be talking uh, a little consciousness, our favorite subject, with uh, Richard Barrett. But first, how's it going, buddy? Hey, Darren. Late uh, night. Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah, Richard's in uh, in the UK, so we're we're up late and he's up early. So, yeah, this is uh, Richard's got quite the bio here. I'm just gonna just gonna highlight a little bit, and we can talk uh, talk about the rest of it with with Richard. Uh, his latest book out is The Matrix of Human Consciousness. So I think it's going to be a little bit of a different take for us on consciousness. It seems uh, pretty 
psychological and cu- culturally orientated. Uh, Richard Barrett's, uh, he's an author, speaker, internationally recognized thought leader on the evolution of human values in business and society. So he's been helping businesses and cultures and, and you know, personal people realize how they can, I guess, improve through measuring consciousness and their own consciousness. So he's also written quite a few books, a value-based approach to unleashing human potentials, value-driven, values-driven organization. So that's going to be a little bit of a different take for us here. And he's also a fellow of the World Business Academy. He's a founder and chairman of Barrett Value Center. And uh, the list goes on and on. So before uh, we'll get the chance for you to update us on all that, Richard, but welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much. Yeah. It sounds like, uh, with you. yeah, it's, it's great. Thanks for uh, getting up so early. And, and uh, I just got your book uh, recently in the mail. We had a chance to flip through a little bit. I didn't get a chance to read it page for page, but it sounds like an interesting genesis how you uh, just recently over the last couple of years realized that you had to sort of put all put a lot of your work into this book called The Metrics of Human Consciousness. Do you want to talk about how you came about to write this one? Yeah, sure. Uh, in fact, I, uh, I kind of invented this way of measuring uh, human consciousness uh, ooh, way back in 1996, 97, hmm. uh, while I was still at the World Bank. And then I left the World Bank because I realized I'd found something really interesting because if you can measure something you can manage it and if you can measure consciousness you can manage consciousness which means we can all uh, we can all evolve consciously if you can measure something so right, that was like right. a, a big awakening and so i left the world bank and set up a company which um, you know measures consciousness in organizations and with individuals such as leaders hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It, it's almost. Um, I'd like you to eventually talk about how you define consciousness in in this because it's it's somewhat different than the way I think about it sometimes. But but uh, so you've you've been measuring, thinking about measuring consciousness for a long time. But you 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 kind of got uh, finally put this book together here in the last uh, last little while. Do you want to talk about yeah. how you, how you met? Uh, you know, you, you were chatting with some guys, I think there was Ken Wilbur and a couple other guys you are talking about that kind of made you realize you guys got to put something like this together. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. You know, we've been, we've been doing this very successfully all over the world for about uh, 15 or 16 years. And I got talking to Mark Gaffney at the Center for Integral Wisdom, mm-hmm. and he he wanted to he wanted to further the whole idea of measuring consciousness. I said, well, you know what? We've been doing it a long time. I don't, why don't I write it up in a, in a way that uh, aligns with your thinking? And, um, and the more I thought about the idea, I thought, well, wow, why didn't I think about this earlier? Because I mean, this is something we've been doing for a long time. Hmm. And, and how's it gone so far since the book's come out? Has it, has it been good? Uh, oh, getting a lot of great, feedback and um, there are there there are there's a, there are not many uh, hmm, not many people who purport to measure consciousness and uh, you know the way that we do it is through a model called the seven levels of consciousness model and um, each level of consciousness uh, is represented by certain values um so if you're uh, you know if you're without of work and you've lost all your money you're going to operate out of survival consciousness mm. and so I, I related values to these levels of consciousness and uh, and i built that model by thinking about maslow's hierarchy and also integrating something called vedic philosophy that looks at higher stages of development um spiritual stages if you like hmm. yeah that's interesting Actually, so what would what would be an example of the different levels of consciousness? Okay, well, I gave you one there. That's the survival. Yeah, you know, that I really like, so, them really cool. I, sorry, would it be? I guess is it um, is it like a scale then, like a one to ten sort of thing, or are they all sort of equal? Uh, no, they're actually uh, evolutionary because 
you know, you start off as a baby. Uh, these levels of consciousness are also stages of development. So mm. you, you start off as a baby, you enter the world. I mean, your DNA is encoded for survival. You know how to smile, mm. you know how to suckle, but you really, it's all about survival at that point. And then, you know, when you get to about two years old and you've got some of your mental faculties and you're, and you can speak, etc., you you begin to realize you have to fit into this world. If you want to be safe, you better fit in so along comes the conforming stage of psychological development and and then that goes on until you're about eight and you begin to realize that you're actually out now with other kids and you know there's competition and you begin to realize that you need to differ if in order to feel safe in your little groups you need to you need to be able to differentiate yourself and be respected and recognized by other people and and that goes on pretty much up into your 20s and 30s and some people actually just never get past that stage uh, and right. i call these ego stages of development where you you're trying to fit inside this cultural framework that you live in and you're trying to fit in and 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 you know feel safe and secure and respected yeah so so the people that get stuck in that ego ego stage of development I, I guess those are the people that just kind of go through life i don't i don't want to sound um negative but they just they just don't wake up they kind of just go through life sort of content the way things are um yeah i think you mentioned also that your culture could make a difference in that way right like if you're in a content culture with uh family and friends around you know, you haven't traveled a lot or had many peak experiences, you might stay in that stage. But if you've had some exposure to different cultures and different world views, then you could actually, that could kind of accelerate you up the levels a little bit. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, uh, and you're right that, you know, if you live in a very authoritarian uh, regime, I mean, According to the Economic Intelligence Unit, there's only like 26 nations which are full democracies, uh, and then there's various graduations of democracy. Yeah, when, or, when you live in a regime, you know, a, a, a regime, authoritarian regime, they don't like free thinking. They don't like intellectuals. They lock them up. Well, you see, that's the next stage after differentiating is the individuating stage where you begin to realize that, okay, I am not this with these beliefs and this values of this culture which I grew up in. There's more to me than that, and I want to discover what that is. And And so, but that is not something that uh, these authoritarian regimes uh, find acceptable. In fact, they find it threatening. Huh. I was fascinated by the peak, the peak experience thing. Like the, because we, I mean, of course we do a show like this. We talk about all kinds of fringe topics and a lot of the authors we have on the researchers have been through some sort of like <laughs> synchronistic experience or a spiritual awakening of some sort or, or and it can even be trauma based, right? Near death experiences, or uh, who knows, addiction, that type of stuff. So, can you talk about how a peak experience can affect um, your levels of consciousness? Sure. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, before I do that, let me just finish off the. You know, we move to the differentiation at third stage. Yeah. 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 It's in the individuating stage, you know, that's like when you're in your thirties, you begin to, you 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 get married and you have children, and you begin to realize that it's, you know you're not just serving yourself. You 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 better look after your family. Your sense of identity expands. If you don't expand your sense of identity, you're not going to be in a marriage or a family very long because. No, it's not just about you, it's about them too. And so we say, you know, your sense of identity expands, and that means you expand your sense of consciousness. So, you know, in the 30s, you begin to individuate, let go of this cultural condition, and then you get to the next stage in your 40s where you call self-actualization, which is when you begin to really get in touch with the things that bring meaning to your life, the things that you're really passionate about. I mean, you guys are passionate about broadcasting and all of this consciousness stuff, and you probably, that's what really turns you on. Well, that's, you know, what happens at that self-actualization stage. You, you find out you're really passionate about it because This is a gift. This is a gift that you came to give in a way. And, and so then after that, you 
you, you find meaning through that, then you want to make a difference in the world. Hmm. That's the next, the sixth stage. And then the seventh stage is when you, uh, when usually when you're in your 60s or so, you, you, you're you just into, you want to give back, you want to live a life of service. Um, now, these are just normal stages. Now, as I said it, earlier, uh, a lot of the people in the world never really get past that differentiating stage. Either they get locked into the comfortable life or they get locked into not being able to grow because they're in an authoritarian regime wow so you know that's that's we are we're all on that journey these stages of psychological development and and, and your level of consciousness shifts as you move to the different stages but you can drop back as you were indicating to lower levels when you if you have a significant trauma in your life particularly when you're young uh, it makes it leaves an emotional mark that keeps you anchored in these lower stages of development. Or, on the contrary, you talked about people who have near-death experiences. You know, go down the tunnel, see the white light, and come back and realize that you know you don't. When you die, you don't lose consciousness. And so, for them, that peak experience means that they let go of a whole bunch of fear and are able to shift to a high level of consciousness. Yeah, that's fascinating. I like how the ages actually work out for us too. Like I'm in my mid forties, and it's, I, I was reading that thing, and I was thinking, wow, even though I don't have a family, I definitely went through pretty much in a general way that that hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You 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 know you begin to realize that you weren't the cultural conditioning that your parents and you know, but maybe you had free thinking parents, but. But, uh, you know, at this stage, in your 40s, you're beginning to look for and find and and do the things that are really juicy for you, the things that you're passionate about. Oh, isn't that the case, eh, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, why would you be up at midnight recording this show? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Hmm. <laughs> so... I want to I, I want to get into like how you define consciousness a little bit because it, in my head I, I kind of have a different idea about it but I think uh, maybe we should talk about that. Let me before we do that yes you know you can go to a website I can give you you can get it you can map your values to the levels of consciousness and you get a report in like two minutes okay about uh, you know it's a, it's www.valuescenter.com that's v a l u e s and then c e n t r e spelled the european way dot uh -huh. .com the canadian slash way as well <laughs> yeah. yeah the canadian way as well let's not forget it's the canadian way slash pva so that's okay. www.valuescenter.com slash pva go there uh, you'll go to a website it says click here to do a personal values assessment you'll be in about 5 minutes you can do the search you pick out the values that are important to you and then you get a feedback report and it, and it, what it does is it links your values to levels of consciousness mm. now you, the only thing you remember is this is self reporting you know so yeah. so you so you're not being to, you mean, no nobody's totally honest in self reporting but anyhow it gives <laughs> you an indication of what's important to you. you know we we don't like to own up to our shadow you know we anyhow so that's uh, that. That was. Let me just interject that. Sorry. Now, what was the what was the question? No, no, no. That's the... that's good. It all it all fits together there. That's good because I, you know, I, I do want to get back to that a little bit more too. What you're talking about because you guys have had a lot of businesses and a lot of people do this this um, yeah this thing right. Your, your well, survey? thousands of organizations. I mean, yeah. we've got a, we've got a thriving organization and. Yeah. Uh, over 5,000 people around the world have been trained in the, uh, how to use these uh, tools. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, huh. Okay, let's get, let's get back to that because I'm interested in how you've helped companies and, and, and how they've evolved through these, through, through these levels. But let's get back to the definition of consciousness, kind of how, sure. <clears throat> how you relate consciousness to, to your work here. Let's hear, yeah, sure. We, have we defined it before? It's hard to define, man. It's, yeah, it's, it's super hard to define. <clears throat> See, I have a weird, yeah, I, I have a weird feeling about it. Like that, I, I kind of think of it as is something that um, that is not in our mind, and yet it connects us to a greater uh, field or a greater consciousness. Like for me, it's kind of more about that than than the uh, 
than an awareness, a cultural awareness? Sure. Um, you know, there are, people define conscious in many different ways, but I, I got a very practical yeah. definition, <laughs> which is, uh, which I use, uh, which we can all use when we're, you know, we, we're living in this three-dimensional physical world. And that is, I say consciousness is awareness. Yeah, it's a, definitely awareness. Mm -hmm. and, there's, and there's a purpose about it. So it's awareness with a purpose. So uh, if I'm, if my current life conditions are such that, uh, you know, I, I've run out of money and I don't have a job, um, my consciousness is focused on survival. That consciousness is awareness with a purpose. So depending on my life conditions, the, the purpose uh, that my, where my consciousness focuses will be different. Now, if I'm if I'm 65 years old and I've got a good pension and I, um, I don't have to worry about survival and I've had a good life and uh, I feel like I've been treated well, you know, so my, my consciousness awareness with a purpose, my purpose here corresponds to that seventh stage of psychological development, which is giving back to the world. And so, so everything that happens to me, I look out at the world through that lens. At the, at the first level, I look out at the world through the lens of survival. At the seventh level, I look out at the world through the lens of uh, giving back or, or service to other people. And so, so depending on where you are in your stages of psychological development, you will be operating with a different lens. In other words, a different level of consciousness. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, right now, you, you know, you, you guys are saying, uh, okay, you know, I'm in my 40s, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited by this consciousness stuff. By the way, I put together a program, you know, uh, internet radio program, which is because it really excites me. And so what are you, where is your consciousness focused right now? Your, your consciousness is focused on, on I would guess, um, uh, looking for opportunities to find meaning through this thing that excites you. Yeah, yeah, and integrating it probably is is uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and when you were a teenager, you know, the differentiating stage, uh, you know, you were your consciousness was focused on looking good and you know and having all the latest stuff you wanted to belong to a group but you wanted to stand out in that group so your consciousness at that stage is focused on on uh, mm, uh, being different but also belonging mm. uh, and you've gone through that stage you don't care about that anymore okay mm. your consciousness shifted so I guess that's just I'm, a, so I'm still a shift behind. Yeah, you're you're a little you are, I'm not as ascended as you. That's <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't have to be. It's you're not, not as old to, as him. <laughs> so I guess that's in general, and I guess people can reach those other levels when they're younger, like service. Some people go into you know like more of a consciousness about serving earlier on that type of thing. Well, okay, so, you know, most people follow this scheme, this sort of plan, this, this the journey, but you see, there's another factor here that's really important, and that is uh, your worldview. Right. So, worldviews shift uh, slowly, um, and there have been about eight different worldviews uh, measured so far. So, there are a lot of young people now, well, call them the millennial generation or, you know, thereabouts, who, who are uh, much more into making a difference in a way. But that's a worldview. They're still going to move through these stages of psychological development, even though uh, they, they, they may move more quickly. In fact, I was just researching that the last couple of days. Hmm. Where, um, you know, the, the, this uh, new generation were brought up by parents who were relatively affluent. And these kids have, you know, they've been uh, 
they've been taken care of. They, their health has been, they've never had such good health and they've uh, been uh, encouraged by their parents. Um, and so they've moved through those first three stages of psychological development or are moving through them in a real easy fashion. And so they're individuating earlier in life and, and, uh, and you know, the, but they still will need to move through these stages. That's interesting because I, I wondered about that. I was just talking to a fellow today at the phone store and we were talking about this sort of big picture stuff and, and the generation that he was in. And, and he, was, he was saying that, uh, that he thinks that a lot of people are just distracted by social media and like a lot of younger people and, and uh, you know, Twitter and their iPhones and all this kind of stuff. And they weren't really aware, but I was saying to him that I thought different of his generation. I thought that they were like you say, uh, kind of lazy. In, no. And to making a difference. No, I, th I think what Richard's saying is that, that they're, <clears throat> they're a little more aware, healthier and aware than, than like my generation. That's interesting. And uh, so, so this leads us into uh, another conversation, which uh, about the soul and mm. why the soul incarnates. And uh, you know, my belief is that the soul incarnates for the purpose of self-expression. And there are two aspects to that self-expression, connection and contribution. And you, you, uh, you live a life of connection by being able to love yourself and love others, living a, a values-driven life, and you make contributions by focusing on your creativity and living a purpose-driven life. And so, so what we're seeing now is a whole new generation connecting. You know, it's it's a really fascinating how they that they are using modern technology to connect mm, with mm -hmm. each other. Obviously. You can use that technology for good purposes mm -hmm. and bad purposes. You can use it for bullying as well as for connecting. But, but so we'll get, we're, we're moving into a world which is highly, more highly connected. People are more highly connected, which is, a, for me, is an aspect of, of soul consciousness. Because when you get to the higher stages of development, you realize that, we're, you, that from an energetic point of view, we're all one in a sense. We're all individuated aspects of that same energy field. And so... So, so in the physical world, that manifests uh, through the internet as our ability to connect more easily with other people. Yeah, wow, that's interesting. I've always had a, a more positive view of the social media and the technological aspect of that, too. I, I think that this is giving humanity what they desire as far as connecting with people. Again, some of it might be bad, some of it might be good, but we can now connect like we never have been. It's almost like a metaphorical brain with little... New little perth pathways opening up all the time, all over the place. Yeah. Mm. I wonder how many. Yeah, I wonder what the ratio would be for connections made on the internet per second and the connections made on a brain per second. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I couldn't answer that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I did want to ask you about well, about past lives. One is though. approaching the. You want to ask about past lives? Yeah, because mm -hmm. well, I, I, I was thinking when I was reading reading part of your book there, I was wondering. Because you talk about experiences when you're young and all these traumatic experiences or whatever. And I thought, do you take or have you had to think about not taking past lives into account or into account? And then you just mentioned that, you know, incarnation. So I wondered about that. Yeah, well, I, um, I, you know, I've written 10 books and I, I write for specific audiences. So yeah, yeah. I've got another book called What My Soul Told Me, <laughs> uh, a practical guide to soul activation where i would talk about oh, okay. where i talk about past lives and incarnation but in this book on consciousness i'm focusing it more on the mainstream and so i don't talk about uh, i don't talk about past lives and and, and i don't talk about uh, i do mention soul incarnation but i don't really talk about past lives so um it, it's it's an area where um i I have some experience in the sense, uh, not that I've had past lives, I have probably, but um, I, uh, you know, one way back uh, 30 years ago, I got into uh, uh, hypnotherapy a little bit and I did some past life regressions with people. And it became obvious to me that 
that was really uh, I started doing more research on past lives, and I, and I it was clearly hmm. obvious to me that there's a, a huge amount of truth in that. Um, but it is also by the main. It's also a little bit ridiculed by the mainstream, and and, and my whole idea is how can we move consciousness forward? Well, you have to address the mainstream and take them, move them up a notch, you know? Right. And that's what I try to do in my books. I try to move the average level up a notch for writing for people and not putting them off, but uh, but allowing them to, to, to see, okay, there's something better than the stage we're at. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I totally can understand that. Yeah. What do you think about the... Uh uh like can you using external means like meditation or psychedelics to kind of cheat and jump a few notches up the scale well um i'm I'm, i don't know anything about psychedelics and drugs never been there never done that and um so uh, you know anything i say on that would be hearsay Uh, as far as a as far as meditation is concerned, I think that is a really useful tool. And, it, it, you know, it didn't meet – it met with some resistance in the business world when people said, well, you know, we we'll teach meditation in the workplace and it will help you deal with stress. Well, you know, it, it would, but it meant so – met with some resistance but what's happened now is really interesting Mm -hmm. this whole concept of mindfulness Mm -hmm. has really has really taken hold you know it it wasn't as far out as meditation so so this is why i say you know i write my books i'm very careful about how i position my books so mindfulness is now pretty much accepted because it has uh quite a bit of um of uh academic research behind it and 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 doesn't link to uh, cosmologies such as you know far eastern thought etc and so it's much more accepted in the in the western world um the western scientific world and it and so these are great so so mindfulness uh, and meditation are really great for moving you along the process However, there is a you still have to bring your fears, your subconscious and conscious fears or your subconscious fears into your conscious mind and deal with them mm. in order to grow and develop. Meditation helps that, but you still have to do that hard work of saying, you know, I don't like this about myself and I keep I keep falling down in a, in an emotional sense and i keep getting angry and upset about these stupid things and i can't stop it why well behind all of that are these subconscious fear-based beliefs you probably learned in childhood which you need to deal with and to deal with them you have to name them and bring them into your conscious awareness and and begin to realize that they that they you know they may not be true now they were it may be true when you were a child, when it was very difficult to, you know, get your needs met in a difficult parental situations, but it's not true now. Hmm. Do you have any techniques that specific techniques that would help you do that? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, in, in my book, uh, the, uh, what my soul told me, a practical guide to soul activation. The second part of the book is, is full of techniques for moving you up through these different stages of psychological development. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, th- ways of thinking that um, which allow you to 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 to, to n- not take what is happening so seriously and begin to allow yourself to uh, let go of 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 what is. Uh, uh, upsetting you. Here's a you know a little example. Um, uh, the, the the technique of saying, well, uh, uh, you know, whatever you say to me, you cannot upset me or make me angry. What makes me angry and upset is what I believe about what you just said. You just triggered a, an old uh, subconscious fear-based belief in me that I've never really dealt with. A need that has never been really um met and you just triggered that in me so i made myself upset uh you didn't make me upset and and so owning your upset 
it is a fantastic way to begin to deal with it. So you don't you don't project your anger out onto other people. You own your anger. You own your own uh, upset as something that you haven't dealt with in the past. Uh, another technique is is saying whenever you have emotional pain, it, it, it's you know think of it as something positive because it's pointing right at what you need to work on to get your ego and your soul back into alignment. So, you know, these are just a couple of little techniques, but that book, What My Soul Told Me, is, is full of things that you can do to um, to, to accelerate this uh, or, or make it smoother, this uh, growth period that we huh. all go through in our lives. So let's stick with that a bit. I, I don't know how this will go over on, on the, on the uh, podcast here, but Darren filled out his uh, personal value values assessment i did oh brilliant <laughs> and i've got the results okay. i've got the results in front of me here so so oh, great yeah so i want to try and just read it out to you here and see if you can uh, i think i got a yeah, four okay. did i get a four is that how it works page. what's that there's a page go ahead sorry go ahead richard yeah there's, i think it's page three where yeah. you which summarizes yeah exactly what you put in. Yeah, yeah. So it's got like okay, an uh, okay. So it's got like an hourglass thing here, and it's uh, yeah. That's it's got levels, the seven the levels, level. seven down to one. So yeah, Darren's where got uh, he's got no circles in the selfless service area, which is at the top. Son of a number bitch. six. He's got <laughs> making a positive difference in the world. He's got one circle there. Finding yeah. meaning in existence. That's level five. He's got three there. Letting mm -hmm. go of fears is. Uh, the, the courage to develop and grow, he's got one, that's the one right in the middle, and then it goes down to three, two, one, and feeling a self, feeling a sense of self-worth is one, and then he's got three in feeling protected and loved, and one of them is, uh, it's got a white circle there, it's potentially limiting. And I know what that is, is being liked. Oh, there you go. Is there. it? Uh, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's feeling yeah, protected feel like. and, and loved, yeah, yeah. And then there's one uh, one circle on satisfying uh, our physical and survival needs. Yeah. And what's that one? That's uh, what's that word? What's that word? Oh, tr oh, yeah. there's the it's word down there. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's it's trust. Trust. Yeah. No, no trust. Trust is is level five. What's the one at the bottom? Oh, it just says satisfying our physical and survival needs. Yeah. Okay, well, there must be a list of... Yeah, let's see. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Down at the bottom is job security. <laughs> okay, there you go. I see what you're saying, because it says area one there. Okay, cool, yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, so so, so that, that's exactly what I was talking about, this survival level. Okay, well, for for him, it's job security, you know, and, and, and that's in his awareness. Otherwise, he wouldn't have chosen that value. Now, somebody who doesn't, isn't thinking about job security wouldn't chose that. So, so you see, here's his, here's his awareness showing up as these um, 10 values, and these 10 values map to these different levels of consciousness. So, even though he's, you know, got some fears about, you know, job security, um, um, he's still uh, at that. He's got three values at level five, which um, the meaning and purpose level, which is saying, wow, I'm really looking to, to somehow find out what it is that, you know, excites me and, and, and do more of that. Huh. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read them back up uh going from down to up because now i've figured out how to just get the word that uh from the category so yeah sure. and, and he was and uh, richard was right about the other one so it goes job security and then it goes family and caring and being like that's the one that richard got right so that's your limiting your limiting one and then uh, it goes achievement and then continuous learning enthusiasm and a positive attitude humor fun and then leadership that's that's how it goes up the levels so yeah very cool yeah i'm a four so it, well no there's yeah, no, so I, when you, is there an n number why do you oh, say you're a I four don't i don't think there's an overall average or anything is there no no there's no yes. no but there's okay. different levels and, yeah, and, right. and there's a tech bit of tech there's a bit of text there that describes you and you know when you read through that text i'd be interested to know whether you feel it's like accurate 
But, um, you know, what does that text say down on the right hand of the page? Yeah, it says, oh. uh, from the values you selected, it is clear that you are a person for whom meaning is important. You have a strong set of moral standards, which are important in how you treat others and how you wish to be treated. Having close relationships and connections with others is important to you. You need to feel a sense of love and belonging. If these needs are threatened or not met, you'll experience anxiety about not being accepted or not being loved enough. Mm. Uh, your values show oh. that uh, living with a passionate and upbeat, fun-loving approach are important to you. Being successful in your endeavors is important. You're protective and considerate of others. Seeking new opportunities to develop and grow keeps you consistently challenged. Close relationships are of utmost importance and are central to the discussions that you make. No, to the decisions that you make. Hmm. Feeling your job is safe and that you'll be able to provide yourself in the future is essential. And you enjoy having opportunities to guide and direct others. And you're not afraid to take charge. Building confidence in others and wanting others to feel that they can rely on you are key factors in your interactions. Yeah, that's pretty. Eh? Seems pretty astute. Yeah, that's pretty pretty bang on. Pretty bang on, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Well, that's what we found. We, you know, over a hundred thousand people have done that since we put it up two years ago. Wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, it really it really works. It's it, it, people go, wow, I didn't. That is so. Wow, accurate. That is amazing. Um, so what people tend to describe this model as elegant and simple. And um, it's elegant because there's many more layers of complexity than we're able to just do on an automatic process. When you do it in an organization, there are many, many more layers of complexity. But it's very simple and un e easy to understand. It doesn't take very long to get it, to get, get the, this link between values and and stages of development or levels of consciousness. So do you think, is this something that's being kind of exploited, do you think, for nefarious? Like, I mean, if it's that easy to get a read on people, I mean, it must be like Google must have us pretty well figured out to a T. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do. I don't know what methods they use, but I'm sure they do. They're like, what websites do you visit? Yeah, man, absolutely. Which keys do you hit harder? Oh, yeah, funny. but you see, the thing that Google don't do is they, they don't link that to levels of consciousness or stages of development. They, they, they you know, they, they link it to they your see, consuming needs. Yeah, they, exactly. They link it to your consumer needs. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get ground to do his before we do the intro to this. Yeah. yeah see okay. how, his, how his comes out. Yeah. So, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious because I, I, I went through the uh, sort of the corporate world for a while too, and I was in change management and business improvement and all that. And so I took some, some courses and, and did some kind of, uh, you know, like we would have consultants come in and stuff like that. So I'm interested in how this translates to, like you were saying just a couple of seconds ago there, about, about businesses, and it gets a little more complex. But how do you change? from manage, uh, measuring uh, personal levels of consciousness to, to a business? Like, how can you tell where the business is at? Okay, well, it, it's, uh, it's, in the, it's in the book there, but I'll explain it to you. Um, you know, so, so people use our survey tool in an organization. Employees go online and they pick 10 values about who they are, exactly as you've just done. And then they pick 10 values about how your organization operates, how their organization okay. operates. Now, the list of words you pick from here is slightly different because, you know, you, there's things like customer satisfaction and things like that in there, which are not in the personal values list. But every value is linked to a level of consciousness. So you pick out, the employees pick out 10 words which represent who they are, 10 words about how they see their organization operating, and 10 words about how they'd like it to operate. So you've got personal values, a view on the current culture, a view on the desired culture. And then we plot those values in the same way that we ju you just looked at that plot. And what you see is, is, is normally are gaps or differences in levels. So people, you know, in a 1,000-person organization, and by the way, you can use this tool for any size of organization from five people to 
350,000 people, and we even use it in nations. Anyhow, you, you can see that people are uh, operating uh, mostly at level three, four, and five, um, whereas their organizations tend to be concentrated in the first three levels, and <laughs> yeah. their desired culture is up in the upper levels. Right. And, and, and so, so, the, so this gives you almost like a roadmap for change. Hmm. And when organizations do this year after year, what we see is we see the current culture improving, moving, spreading out and moving upwards. And we see the desired culture then changing to a higher level. So there's always a sense of movement. And then you get to a point after a few years where you look at the diagram and you see, see all of the dots which represent values at different levels. They begin to align with each other. And, and, and that, uh, at that point, you know, you've got a really high-performing organization because people go to work and their needs are met and they, uh, you get a high level of employee engagement. People bring their discretionary energy to their work because they just enjoyed being at work and all enjoy the work and feel passionate about it. And, and you've got a high performing organization that's very successful. How would you get that in the door to someone who is <laughs> not too, you know, is maybe a little apprehensive? Well, first thing I would do is, is, get them to uh, uh, I, I do that personal values assessment that you've just done uh, because it, it begins you get it, it begins to unlock the idea that you can actually measure this intangible thing um, and then I get them to do a pilot if it's if this person was in a large organization uh, the leader I'd say well we you know why don't you do it in you know in your team or this team before you do it in the whole organization, you know, get a get your feet wet and understand what it's going to do before you take it out and roll it out. Now, there are some more people who or organizations who get started with this, um, usually like small or medium sized, and and the leaders, you know, they see the results and they can't and they deny them because there's a lot of what we call cultural entropy, a lot of those white dots, you know. I wanted to ask you about entropy, that. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, so we measure something called cultural entropy, which is, you see, you know, these are fear-based values so that show up like bureaucracy, hierarchy, internal competition. Denial. And th these all reflect, these all reflect like ego fears about, you know, uh, and so um, we can measure cultural entropy, and 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 in fact, that's one of the first things that our users look at in organizations: of what happened to our cultural entropy this year? Did it go up or did it go down? Mm -hmm. And uh, and what happens is when you do this work year by year, and you've been in change management, you know, when you make changes and you and they're successful, what happens is there's more values alignment, and therefore cultural entropy goes down. And so, you know, we've got many organizations who've used our tools who've gone from 25, 30% cultural entropy, which is a lot of energy going into unproductive activities like bureaucracy, et cetera. Um, they've gone down from a 20, 30 to 25, down to 12, 10% cultural entropy. It's difficult getting below 10% cultural right, entropy right. in a large organization. In a small organization, it's easy, but... Um, and, and, but you, you know, ten percent culture entropy is brilliant. I mean, that is if that's what you've got, and you're a large organization, I'd say you're doing really well, and you'll have quite a high level of employee engagement because there's a, there's a, there's a relationship between employee engagement and cultural entropy. When entropy goes up, the degree of frustration goes up. Uh, employee engagement goes down, and when entropy goes down, engagement goes up. That's fascinating because this isn't really, you're not just, you know, spouting off the stuff. This is what happens in corporations, right? Like it's pretty scientific exactly. at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we have thousands of users who, 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 who do this on a regular basis. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> I just, I, I love the, how you can connect uh, engagement, employee engagement to, to this stuff because it's, <clears throat> it's hard when you talk to people that don't really see the correlation between these things, like having, you know, direction in a company or having, 
um, you know, this this sort of continuous improvement feedback loop from the employees and the right. and then the ownership, right? right? It's it's uh, but this is a way where you can actually show it, and you know, it's kind of more Absolutely. cut and dry scientific. Exactly. It, it, it really, it's not like consultants coming in and giving them your their opinion. This is this is what the employees are saying, and and you better pay attention. Now, where does cultural entropy come from? Is a good question, and um, you know, cultural entropy is actually a measure of the personal entropy uh, of the leaders um, and the uh, and the legacy of past leaders who have left their personal entropy inside the systems and processes which control employees or uh, the incentive programs, if you like. Wow. And so, right. So people's values, a leader's values get inculcated into the systems and processes. And so when if you want to bring about a cultural transformation, not only do you have to work with the leaders to change their values, but you also got to look at the, all of the systems and processes and the policies and procedures and make sure that they are rewritten in alignment with the values that people want to live by. Well, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So the, yeah, the yeah. Sort of systems and policies are important, right? To change, to change that, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because they set up the incentives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and you can incentivize bad behavior, you know, when yeah. you, you know, so, and you can also, you know, you can basically say in your policies, uh, uh, particularly when it's highly bureaucratic, that uh, we don't trust you. And therefore you better fill out this form, this form, this form, this form before you can even do X and Y, which is takes, that, that involves a lot of time. And so all that time is now not, a, not available for useful work. Yeah. And so, and so when you've got a high uh, cultural entropy, like 30, 40, or 50 percent, your company really doesn't perform very well because there's so much energy going into unproductive activities. Um, you know. hmm. So, so let's take it to the next level. Then you can generalize a a, a nation now. Yeah, and we, I, we've done this in 20, 26 nations. Okay, yeah. how, how's Canada? Including Canada, including, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, good. I, I, can't, I don't have the details right in front of me, but uh, the, you can actually see it. You can go online and see it if you go to valuecenter.com and then look up um, uh, products for nations. You'll find somewhere in there uh, uh, the, um, the results for all 26 nations, including Canada. Um, Canada didn't turn out to be so bad as some nations. Um, quite a high <laughs> level of cultural entropy, but not as high as many. Um, and, um, you know, Canada shows up quite well in these international comparisons because, uh, particularly in comparison to the USA, because it's a different culture, um, as you well know. Yeah, yeah, it would really show up. It, 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 yeah, I wonder if we're similar to, I always feel like we'll be, we'd will be we be more similar to the Scandinavian countries or, or Australia. You, you just nailed it. Oh, really? You just nailed it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's what the, that's what it shows from our from our uh, you know our analysis because we've done eight consecutive years of measuring the values of Sweden. Uh, we we also map the values of Denmark and Iceland, uh, but um, particularly S Sweden and Canada are uh, 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 similar. And you know when you look at all of these you know world scales of democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, yeah, Canada and the Scandinavians are always pretty close to each other. Huh, that's interesting. So is there any other correlation to now that you're measuring this for eight years? That's great. So you're going to have some really good uh, statistics in, in another few years for sure. But is there any other yeah. correlations to, oh, man, I don't know, happiness scales or, or, or uh, GDP or um, economic uh, security or anything like that? Well, that's we we just don't have enough data yet to yeah. be able to to be able to make those correlations. But here's uh, I, I've been you know I'm working on a new book now, and I've been looking at this whole well-being and happiness thing, and I believe that this model is a better way of tackling that whole topic than um, the, the current ones because um, the the main problem with the 
the current measurement of happiness and well-being is it's like one size fits all. They have a set of questions which they apply to all age groups. Well, right. as I've just said, you know, at different stages of development, you have different needs and therefore different things are important. So when you satisfy the needs at the stage of development you're at, you're happy, but those are different. So, so having this one thing fits all doesn't make a lot of sense. To me, you want to be able to really find out whether older people are happy and younger people are happy and whether their needs are being met and to what extent they're not being met. Now, that's what we do in organizations. When we do an organization, we'll pull out the data by male and female, by age group, and, and you'll see definite differences um, as to whether they're well, there's a values alignment and whether there's high or low cultural entropy between different age groups. So that's really important to do. And I think um, this is one of the reasons I wanted to demonstrate this in nations, because I believe this is a much better way of developing a well-being index than anything that we've got out there right now, because the, 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 there's no – all of the models we use right now uh, don't have this – uh, different graduations for different age groups and don't ask different questions, don't don't seek different answers for different age groups. And I think that's really important. And we, you know, in the work that we did in the United Kingdom, um, not only did we split it out by male, female and different age groups and found differences, we also split it out by different regions of the country and we found out that certain regions people are much happier than in oh, other regions. Right, right, right. So you could do it at multiple levels, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised by Brazil and Belgium. I'm just flipping through your chart here. They're, they look like they're in pretty bad shape as far as this goes, right? Right. Well, so, you know, the, the, the level of cultural entropy in those two countries is high. And that, you see, so it's inter really interesting. When you ask the question, what values do you see in your nation? What values would you like to see in your nation? And then you ask, what values would you like to see in, you see in your community? What values would you like to see in your community? The level of cultural entropy you see in the nation is often much higher than the, the level that you actually experience in your community because yeah. you don't actually experience living in a nation. You experience it third hand through the media, et cetera. And, and, but you in your community, you experience it firsthand, and so, um, um, but um, but it's still valid. So, here's the interesting story. When I went to um, when we mapped the values of Iceland, the number one democratic country in the world. When we mapped the values in August two thousand and eight, I was expecting to find a really low level of entropy and things would be really good. I, I didn't know a lot about Iceland. I just knew it was the number one democratic country in the world, according to the Economic Intelligence Unit. So when we saw the results, which like 54% cultural entropy, I was really shocked. And I thought, what the hell's going on in Iceland? So this was August 2008. So in early September, I went to Iceland to present the results in various public meetings. And I said to them, look, you know, with 54% cultural entropy, if you were an organization, you'd be going bankrupt about now. And Iceland went bankrupt two weeks later. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, the timing of that. Oh, Yeah, that was um, unbelievable. Um, but you see, what it said was that, that the people, despite the high level of democracy, people were not they were not happy with the way things that were going, and it was showing up in their choice of values. They were feeling in the current culture that things weren't going as well as they should be doing, and they expressed that through their choice of values, and we had this high level of cultural entropy. Wow, that's interesting. Switz Switzerland yeah. is doing really well, it looks like. Yeah, Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland's quite good, and, you know, it's a, it's a very caring society and also well, very well integrated. I mean, you've got... You know, you've got you've got Italian speaking part, German speaking part, French speaking part. You know, you'd expect that would cause a whole lot of trouble, um, but you know they seem to have integrated these cultural differences very well, and they have a not too bad level of cultural entropy. I mean, you're really getting this now because I can see you're looking at the level of cultural entropy, and you're looking at the values alignment, and you're saying, "Oh, that's quite good. That's not so good." Yeah, what just what surprises I'm me is so many of them are low. <clears throat> yeah, yes, yeah, so high. Yeah, so many are high entropy. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yeah, right. Um, Particularly amongst the Western democratic nations like UK, France, Belgium, 
Italy, Italy has a really high level of cultural entropy. I mean, you know, it's like, what the hell's going on here? Well, you know what? I mean, it's got to show you some in, in some ways that um, it's not really a democracy we're living in. I mean, it's supposed to be a democracy, but it's really turning out to be a corporatocracy, a, a corporatocracy or an oligarchy. And, okay. and, you know, exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, look at the yeah. UAE, the United Arab Emirates is, is way up there, it's, which is kind of strange. Yeah, you, so, so here's the interesting thing, you see. I think what's, what's happened in our democracies is that people have, people have been growing and developing up this consciousness scale, yeah. but, but the form of government hasn't <laughs> grown. Yeah. We need a new form of democracy. I mean, it, it, in fact, it's going backwards, probably. Yeah. We, we just had elections in the UK yesterday, you know, and, and, and I, I say, like you just said, I I don't think I live in a democracy in the UK, and I don't think we do in uh, the in the USA. Uh, and um, why? Because you know I get to participate in democracy five minutes every five years when I vote, <laughs> and that's it. That's my only participation in democracy. Yeah. Now that is not democracy for me. That's not the democracy I want to live in. And I think these high levels of cultural entropy that we're seeing in these more advanced Western nations is a reflection of that sentiment that I'm giving, that it's like, this is not what I want as democracy. I want something better than what we've got. Yeah. We should be able to vote on our smartphones on, you know, maybe not every issue, but most of them, you know, maybe the bigger yeah, ones. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah. wonder when that'll. You wonder which country is going to be first to really embrace technology as far as a political system goes. You know, get back to yeah. the way the way Greece started it way back when, right? Yeah. So, so, so you know, this is part of the reason I think that, that we got that we're seeing these high levels of cultural entropy in nations. Uh, fortunately, in these nations, you know, the level of cultural entropy at the community level is not so high. It's about half the that amount, right, which right. is much better. Yeah, of mm -hmm. thy neighbor. Yeah, love, love thy neighbor. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's you know, and that's really love thy neighbor is really important because when you love your neighbor, they love you, and and that's the message really about organizations. When you care about your employees, they care about you. Yeah, yeah. That positive reinforcement goes a long way as compared to negative feedback. Yeah, in another book of mine, go the the values driven organization. I I look at the. 100 best companies to work for in America, and I pick out 20 of them, and I, and I do a back forecast. What does that mean? I, I, I go back 10 years, and I look at their uh, per, uh, financial performance as a, measured through their share price and, and a return on investment. And, and, and when you look at these best companies to work for, they, they have an annualized return of like 15%. Whereas the S and P five hundred is like four point three percent, so 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 you know this this proves my point that when you know the best companies to work for are the companies that care about employees and they have the best returns on investment. I mean, it's it's really simple. It's not that difficult to understand. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It's not, but for f yeah, for some people, they would have a hard time just making that. That connection, exactly. right at the at the company level, it's hard yeah, to it's hard to say to somebody like a, a boss or somebody to say if your people are happy, they're going to be more productive. Like it just sounds so cliche. Yeah, but it's so true. Yeah, yeah. And, and people are ha and that, my point in that book, the values driven organization, is that the chapter three is on what employees want. Uh, I say you know depending on where people are in the stages of psychological development, what they want is something different. So if they're at that uh, meaning level, that level five consciousness personally, you know, they're, they're wanting work which is not just challenging but meaningful right. to them. Right. And, and and so if you can give them that, you'll you know, they'll be happy. Uh, now if you've got an organization which is um, mostly made up of uh, manual workers, you know, doing some manual tasks like cleaning the streets, etc. Um, these people have not necessarily evolved into these higher levels. What they're focused on is meeting their deficiency needs, these first three levels. They're more focused on survival, having, having a, 
uh, adequate salary um, on the relationship level or have having friendships and 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 at the differentiation stage on 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 um, uh, having opportunities to 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 move forward uh, you know not always to be locked at that same level but opportunities to learn and grow um, and and eventually they might get to those higher levels of uh, consciousness leave that work altogether and go and do something different huh i go ahead darren so can this be easily sort of i guess downsized just to a personal level or a daily a daily sort of routine for for an individual um I'm not quite sure what you mean by, by that question, but you know, you've just done the personal values assessment. That so that's just you. I guess that's um, the same you, idea. No, it gives you actually. Yeah. I think it gives you an like an action plan, like a personal development plan at the end of it. There. So, so what you can do is you can do what I, we call an individual values assessment, where you you go online and pick ten values about who you are, ten values how you see your organization operating, ten values how you'd like to see it operation, but you don't add all those up for all employees to get a culture. You just it's, That's just your map. And, and you'll see quickly whether, in fact, you feel aligned with your work or not. Oh, that's and, interesting, for a lot yeah. of people, and a lot of people use that. Hmm. And, um, and so they, they, you know, they, one of the big aha experiences when people do that is like, you know, you know, I felt like I didn't fit in, but now I see this data that I've just plot you've given me of my values, how I see the values in my organization, and how I'd like to see them. I realize why I don't fit in. I can see exactly why I don't fit in. And what I need to do is look for an organization that aligns with my values. Right. Maybe you shouldn't do the thing, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I, I, hate to, I hate to even even ask this or go there but i guess it must be hard or you've probably at some point looked at political systems in these countries or or um hmm. do, do you have a i don't even want to get into politics really but do you have a political leaning uh, after looking no. at all this no look at here's here's something really a couple of things really interesting here um after we did the uk values assessment about three years ago now, um, people, some people spontaneously set up, started an organization called the UK Values Alliance. And, and you can look it up on the web. And, and, and they said, look, what we want to do is we want to build a values-driven nation. And so they started working together. They, they meet every quarter in London and they've got several projects. And, and one of the projects that this election was, they tried to get the um, candidates to actually pick the values that are important to them and then make that public um and you know it was a good try and um they had a low response rate but the results were re really interesting so now another story is um the, the fellow from austria got really interested in all these values stuff and decided to build a, a, a political party which focused on values and uh, in the first election, he was quite his party was quite successful, and he just invited me to be um, on their advisory board of this political party, which are focused on, you know, finding out what what values people have, and then uh, and building policies that align with values. I mean, that's a, I mean, not a top down approach, yeah, but a bottom yeah, up yeah, yeah. approach, hmm. right? See, that for me is more like democracy. Yeah, that could be more the, the political system that we're missing. Like, obviously, yeah, yeah. socialism and capitalism yeah. aren't necessarily the answers, but maybe it should no, be no. like, val maybe that's like... Values, values is the answer. Yeah. It's yeah. like, what, are what is it that people, what do they value? You see, what you value is what's important to you and where your unmet needs are. So if you've got unmet needs, you'll value. So, so if you don't have enough, you know, if you don't have a secure job, you value a secure job, right? We just had an example of that, right? So, so you see, it's your need, wherever, what is important to you and what needs you've got have that are not met. And, that, and that's exactly what you should be focusing on because that's going to make your, the people in your, organi in your country happy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Hmm. So, so what's so, your, what's your plans at, like next for this higher level stuff? 
Yeah, well, you know, um, we keep putting out this information and, uh, and, 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 and slowly and slowly. I mean, I've been mapping the values of nations uh, since 2002, and we've been doing it at our own expense. You know, we've uh, started off by just, we want to demonstrate that this is possible. So, so you know, I was just in Saudi Arabia last two weekends ago um, talking at very high level about helping them to build a more values-driven nation. Um, and then I came back, and and this week I had a conversation with some high-level people in Slovakia who are now really interested in doing a values assessment for their nation. So slowly, slowly, this is catching on. Um, you know, it's, you know, we keep pumping out the information, pumping out the messages. And I have another book called Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations, which is actually addresses this whole topic of the evolution of democracy, love, fear, and the destiny of nations. And uh, wow. so, you know, we just do what we can to let people know that this is available and if they want to use it, they can use it. And um, it's now coming back to Sweden, where we've done these several years, actually, the, there is an organization in Sweden called SALA, which is the society, um, an association of all the municipalities in Sweden. Mm. They've latched onto this, and they did um, they mapped the values of uh, nine communities from the citizens' perspective, from the municipal employees' perspective, and from the politicians' perspective. And they, the results were so interesting and so insightful uh, and so helpful in helping those municipalities to grow and develop. They've now decided to do this in all 250 municipalities throughout Sweden. Wow. So what were some of the results? Like, were they all over the map or was there any uh, well, one of the big, one of, one of the big, one of the big ahas was really interesting. Um, I mean, there were lots, but the big aha was that um, the municipal workers, when you looked at the results and compared them to the, the, the citizens' results, you saw that um, the municipal workers had no sense of the fact that they were serving the community. They didn't see their community as customers. In fact, yeah. <laughs> the, the, you know, they didn't. They, they, they felt that cause the, the citizens were a pain in the side because they kept objecting and they kept <laughs> to, to what they were doing, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they began to realize that wait a minute, yeah, we've got this the wrong way around. We actually should be in service to the public. And so listening to the customers or listening to the citizens became out like a really top issue based on the results of these surveys, uh, which really then meant a radical change in, in, in the way that the new municipalities approach their work. Wow. So are you talking about the people that work for municipalities, like, for example, the the city workers, yeah, the city workers and stuff like that, yes, or, yeah, or the yeah, politicians, yeah. the planning authority, yeah, the no, planning authority, planning the, whole, authority the, the whole system, the, right? Yeah, road, road, roads engineers, the yeah. social side, the social care, yeah. you know, the whole, <laughs> the whole, the whole bunch of services that cities provide. Maybe that's all like people need to get that jump start is some measurement, like you said, and like exactly. I heard, I heard about in the corporate world too. Is you can't if you can't improve it if you can't measure it, and that's kind of true. So maybe people just need this on paper on a graph to say, hey, this is where the big gaps are. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Huh. And that's my whole point. I mean, you can measure it, you can manage it. And when, now we're talking about making the evolution of consciousness conscious because we can measure it. Now, that's never happened before in human history. Right. And it'll accelerate. It seems to me like it could be, a, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when things accelerate faster, exponential acceleration, right? If, if, if more and more people keep a doing this. Jump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So do you have anything else you want to mention before we start wrapping it up? Well, no, I've really enjoyed talking to you guys. And, uh, you know, it's been fun and enjoyable, and um, I felt very relaxed. And I just want to appreciate you two guys for who you are. Oh, thanks. You know, you, you nice. know I mean, yeah, you, you know, you, you're following your own path. You're following your own energies. You're doing what you love to do and maybe at some sacrifice. And, 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 and you know, all I want to say is, well, thanks for showing up in the world. 
Oh, that's nice. Yeah, thanks. No, I really, we really appreciate that. And it's, I mean, it's, that's kind of what's coming across is uh, we want to make people feel relaxed and have an open forum where we can just casually discuss the stuff. So we appreciate guys like you out there doing a lot of the research and really, really pushing the stuff forward. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll we'll link to we'll link to all your stuff there in the show notes and yeah, well you can re- link to you know valuecenter dot com and richardbarrett.net is uh, is my own uh, part of that website richardbarrett.net. In fact, we're just upgrading that whole website in about two or three weeks. It'll be you know when you, we yeah, everybody upgrades their websites everybody every four or five years and it's like a quantum shift in <laughs> in wow that's cool man I didn't know we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just got a, a new site ourselves. And... Yeah. So anyhow, um, but that's a. But thanks. That that would be really kind of you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming on the show, and we'll have to. Uh, we'll keep an eye on on his stuff for sure. Keep an eye on your stuff. Yeah. We're gonna get Graham to yeah. try the test. Yeah. <laughs> and then... yeah, try the test. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be bringing out some more books. Uh, uh, you know, I've written t- six in the last six years, so I got more stuff up my sleeve, and um, we can uh, talk about that maybe in some future. Program. Yeah, for sure, we'll do this uh, for sure. I'm in touch with your publicist, so we'll, we'll do this for sure. We'll keep an eye on your stuff, and uh, and good luck going out there with those uh, those other countries. You know, get Saudi Arabia on board, and and some of, What's some more of uh, you've Eastern got Europe, Grand America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got Grand America too. We could put Grand America in the in the list of uh, nations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Richard. Okay, bye. And that was our chat with Richard Barrett about measuring cultural awareness or consciousness. What do you think? I liked it. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it wasn't really what I was expecting going in, but yeah, it was pretty interesting shit for sure. Food it's, for thought. Yeah, it's interesting how when you look at, I like the na- the national look at it, right? When you look at different nations and how they measure up, it really sort of resonates with what you feel some of these nations would be like, right? I mean, of course, there's some unusual ones that you wouldn't think of, but yeah, it's uh I think it's a good, good. Uh, it's a good start. Yeah, totally. I wonder. Maybe it's just doesn't work, though. Maybe it's impossible to measure. Yeah. Why? I don't know. It still seems like there's part of it that's subjective. Of course, but that's that's okay. That's somewhere to start, right? You can't yeah. be, you know. Yeah, it, when you're answering, when you're asking questions and stuff like that, and you're getting people to answer or try and get them to answer honestly, it, it's going to be a little subjective. But I think it still provides trends. And areas for improvement. Maybe our synchronicity segment comes closer. You think so? No. No. Probably not. Some of them. There's some good ones. Yeah, so uh, yeah, he's got lots of interesting, interesting stuff out there. I'm going to link to it all in the show notes. Like we always do. Yeah. I'm You're just, a pro. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Pro notes. Start calling them the pro notes. I wonder if you get an image somehow. I noticed expanded perspectives does that. Do they what? Add an image to the show notes. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Into That's that. asking too much. That's a, it takes me too long. <laughs> Every week, plugging away through the show notes. It's an uphill battle, buddy. Speaking of that, we do put a lot of time into Grand America, and we do have to pay for our four hundred dollars. <clears throat> somewhat modular bomb shelter soundproof booth that we 
are installing in the garage. We plan to be in by the end of the month. I guess that's like a, for our birthday present yeah. to ourselves is our new sound booth. So yeah, we don't want to harp on donations, but we do have monthly expenses. So it is nice to get the help. So thank you for everybody who has donated. And if you haven't, now's the time. Yep. Uh, sign up for the newsletter. If you already signed up, sign up your friends. Actually, for now, you know what? I'd fucking settle for everyone just signing up. Themselves? Yeah. Okay. It's think. super easy. Just throw your email in there. Boom. And then Done. Justin, Justin sends them out. Thanks, buddy. Get little reminders of when we're doing broadcasts. If you want to listen live, if we keep listening live. We're not sure what we're going to do with that. Yeah. We've been getting mixed feedback on the audio quality. So... I don't know, maybe if someone else knows another option we're not thinking of, um, I don't really have time to really look into it anymore. So I'll, I don't mind keep trudging away with Mixler. Uh, but if you have some other options that you think we should be looking at, feel free to spam Graham with them. Um, so of course, support the show, grammerica.ca slash support. Sign up for the newsletter, grammerica.ca slash news. Leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Um, it'd be nice if we could get everyone else to do that. That'd be a good birthday present for the show. Yeah, well, that, that helps America a lot. Yeah, some of these review. some of these shows, like Expanded Perspectives and THC, I don't know how they, uh, if they pay for reviews or what, but man, they have a shit, shitload of reviews. So let's try and catch up with those guys. Yeah, so if you don't have iTunes and the next best place is Stitcher, maybe you should add that to the show notes so people can just click on the link and go to the Stitcher review platform. Okay. And uh, help us grow the hedge money. All right, guys. Oh, yeah. Of course, the number one way is telling your friends about yeah. this show. Yeah. Thanks. For listening, and we'll see you next week. Brain cells are not done forging links with billions of other brain cells.